Hi guys. Don't know about where you might be here, but it is an absolutely spectacularly gorgeous, and I mean over the top, beautiful 84 degree day here uh, in this undisclosed swamp on this lovely. Where are we? Is it Wednesday or is it Thursday? I am losing track of what day it is. I think it might be Thursday, which would make it somewhere around February 18th, 2021. And a couple of you have uh, sent me this article from the good old New Yorker by this fellow you might have heard of named Bill McKibben, and uh, I am like probably some of you on here. I am very conflicted about Bill McKibben, the uh, apocalyptimist Bill McKibben, especially since Planet of the Humans came out uh, last spring. If you have not seen Planet of the Humans, uh, I suggest you remedy that. Uh, so I have been a little bit wary of uh, reading one thing that Bill McKibben has to say about anything. And this article in the New Yorker is the reason I am conflicted about this guy. The, Bill McKibben uh, certainly is not a clueless moron. The guy clearly understands how doomed we are on one hand, but yet he is still, Bill McKibben is still holding out some just outlandish, hopium-soaked idea that the United Nations and the Paris Climate Agreement and the Green New Deal and, and all of this crap uh, are, are going to save the planet. So uh, anyway, uh, I have been wrestling with whether to share this uh, new essay by Uncle Billy uh, with us. And I've decided since I don't have anything else to talk about except for the failed state of Texas, and I've already uh, had a, a, a put in my two cents worth about what's going on over there in Texas. Good Lord. Anybody who does not understand the collapse of global industrial civilization in the 21st century, uh, if you don't get it by now, guys, after looking at, at Texas this week, while it's 84 degrees in Florida, uh, I don't know, we're obviously having a failure to communicate, but anyway, we're going to... Uh, we're going to dip down into anybody who does not understand the concept of apocaloptimism. We're going to hear from the godfather of apocaloptimism himself, Bill McKibben, with the New Yorker, I guess, cheering him on and me cheering him on for the first part of this. This is kind of like a companion piece. Uh, I aired an interview that uh, NPR had with uh, writer Elizabeth Colbert uh, a couple of weeks ago talking about her new book, Under a White Sky. And this is kind of Bill McKibben addressing that book as well. So take it away, godfather of apocaloptimism, Bill McKibben and the New Yorker. The enormous risk of atmospheric hacking, we have a new term for the collapse of a planet, atmospheric hacking, otherwise known as solar radiation management, otherwise known, uh, I understand what we're talking about, chemtrails here, guys, what, what some of the uh, nutters would call chemtrails. Anyway, what does Bill McKibben have to say about this subject? <clears throat> so he wrote this. This came out uh, yesterday. Sometime in the next two weeks, so between now and March 1st, an independent advisory committee, whatever that means, 
is expected to issue a recommendation on a request from a team of Harvard scientists to fly a balloon from Karuna in Sweden's Lapland region. The team would test a flight platform that might someday be used to inject a sample of aerosols into the stratosphere. Though this initial request is only for a test of a flight platform, a successful run would likely mean more tests. Do you think so? With aerosols of calcium carbonate and sulfates, these particles would hack the planet's climate by reflecting some of the sun's light back out to space before it can reach the ground. It is an ominous moment in the planet's history and one we should back away from now. So even Bill McKibben weighing in with, uh, among others, uh, Elizabeth Colbert and uh, Al Gore do not go down this path. This so-called solar geoengineering is the ultimate break the glass response to the climate crisis. <clears throat> it has been in the air, so to speak, for a long time. I wrote about it in, 1990, in 1989 in my book, The End of Nature, but the fullest account yet comes of my colleague Elizabeth Colbert's marvelous new book, Under a White Sky. The title acknowledges the fact that this atmospheric hack would change the blue dome above our heads to a milky gray, which should give you some sense of the scale of this intervention. The argument in its favor is that humanity has done so little to address the climate crisis, despite 30 years of scientific warning, that we might have no choice but to follow our injection of CO2 with an injection of sulfite, sulfate aerosols. Think of it as Narcan on a global scale. This is uh, Harvard's Daniel Schrag, who I have interviewed here on Collapse Chronicles. You can find an interview with Daniel here somewhere. Uh, talking to uh, Elizabeth Colbert, quote, geoengineering is not something to do lightly. The reason we're thinking about it is because the real world has dealt us a shitty hand, close quote. Indeed, it is possible to, to imagine how this happens. Possible to imagine some moment in the future when it is in the survival interest of both, say, the Marshall Islands and ExxonMobil, and they possess enough moral and financial clout to send us down the path. One fraught not just with metaphysical danger, a white sky, but with enormous practical risks. This man-made equivalent of a permanent cloud of volcanic ash might disrupt the monsoons over Asia, it will definitely allow the oceans to continue acidifying. And as the climate scientist and geophysicist Raymond Pierhumbert points out, it gets us ever farther out on a limb because if we are masking increasing carbon with sulfur, we will never be able to stop without triggering a period of accelerated warming. And this is where uh, this term termination shock comes in. I love the term termination shock. Uh, we can put that in with atmospheric hacking in our glossary of the collapse. 
So this is Raymond Pure Humbert. Uh, quote, the disastrous consequences of termination shock, meaning trying to ever stop this once we have started, is what he's talking about, would grow as we cover, as we cower year after year under the flimsy stratospheric sunshade, hoping that technology to suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere on a massive scale becomes practical before disaster strikes. Close quote. Uh -oh, we have incoming aircraft. Do we have chemtrails coming out of the back? Anyway, where were we? It is also, back to Bill, it is also worth imagining how whoever does engineer the sky will be blamed for every weather disaster henceforth. It's bad enough trying to deal with the cascade of nonsense about green energy causing the Texas power outages. And, and just to get off on a red herring here, guys, I, I, I was going to do today's rant about uh, this controversy over whether uh, it was a failure of green energy or a failure of fossil energy causing all of those uh, headaches in Texas. It is not an either or question. It is a both and question. It, it, it is everything. Even Greg Abbott uh, finally had to backpedal and, uh, it, and, and admit that this is not, uh, it, this is one more way to try to politicize the collapse it, it, is what it is. Uh, these clueless morons on the right uh, pointing their fingers at the clueless morons on the left. It is everything failing, okay? Give up trying to politicize this. Uh, it is, everything is failing. Everything is collapsing. Anyway, I guess I just did the rant that I, taught, that I had decided I wasn't going to do. But let's get back to the New Yorker. All right, where were you, Uncle Bill? It would be stupid to say that we will never need to consider a step this horrible. Kim Stanley Robinson in his masterly new novel, The Ministry for the Future, I think I need to get this on my reading list, makes it a plot point. After an epic Indian heat wave claims millions of lives, Delhi launches a fleet of aerosol spewing aircraft to cool the planet. But right now in the real world, progressing with this kind of work takes the heat off our political systems at precisely the moment to the month when they, <coughs> meaning the politicians, are finally beginning to get into gear. And this is where Bill McKibben, uh, you know, this is the point where doomers uh, run the risk of throwing the uh, baby out with the bathwater. This is the point where Bill McKibben, after sounding totally sensible up to this point, just he just crumples just crumples and, and, and starts spewing this hopium-soaked, apocalyptic crap that makes me want to puke. Yes. Uh, they're finally beginning to get into gear. The United States, the world's largest economy, has finally assembled the will to tackle global warming. Yes. Last week's initial meeting of the federal climate team under Gina McCarthy 
was a zoom screenshot. Yes, a zoom screenshot. Don't get me going off on that rant. Of what concentrated power in service of the future might look like. <laughs> concentrated power in the service of the future. I want some of the hopium that Bill McKibben... Uh, did, 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 this, did this clueless moron actually uh, write that with a straight face? Concentrated power in service of the future, meaning uh, concentrated power in service of the future for our planet. Uh, I, I, I mean, the, the, the very, uh, I, I, anyway, guys, if you do not understand uh, how hilarious that is, uh, obviously, I have had a failure to communicate, and uh, you are not quite ready to call yourself a doomer. But anyway, uh, let's, let, let, let me... Uh, this is really tough for me. This is why I just can't take this jackass seriously. Anybody, anybody uh, talking to me uh, about, uh, what was it, I've already forgot, concentrated power in service of the future might look like. Engineers have provided us with cheap solar and wind power. Yes and with affordable batteries to store that power. This means that if we want to, if we want to, hmm, as a civilization, we can devote the next decade to an all-out effort to transform our energy system and the intergovernmental panel on climate change has said that if we do, if we cut our emissions 45% from 2010 levels by 2030, then we have a shot. We have a shot at limiting the temperature rise to the one and a half degrees Celsius target of the Paris Accord. Yes, our attention, all of our attention should be on that goal. If we don't meet it by 2030, then we need to have a serious talk as a species and start assessing our options. Yes, that is the moment for beginning these kinds of tests. Not now when they will become a rallying point for the people and the interest that want to slow the pace in this decade of transformation. Who he's talking about here, are the people in the interest that want to slow the pace, that would be the concentrated power in service of the future. Do we, as, as what, what would Bill Hicks do at this point? Uh... <laughs> Oh, boy. But we cannot have a Bill McKibben uh, essay in the New Yorker without bringing Greta Thunberg into the story here. Yes, well, we have to check in with Greta Thunberg. It is especially ironic for a couple of reasons that Harvard will do this in Sweden. For one thing, it is a Swede, Greta Thunberg who is as responsible as anyone for bringing us to the moment when we might actually pursue a serious course forward to limit emissions. For another, in the face of the climate crisis, Harvard has refused, despite huge support from students, faculty, and alumni, even to join its peers, such as Oxford, Cambridge, and Berkeley, in divesting from fossil fuel companies. 
the Harvard Corporation and its board of overseers even changed the rules of election to the board preventing insurgent climate defending alumni from electing a majority of the seats. It seems clear that the thing we need to test first is not aerosol spewing balloons but our ability as a species to rein ourselves in and it also seems clear that the next decade, not the past five decades, not those decades, but the next decade is the time for that test. If we fail, if we fail, then perhaps we deserve to stare pathetically at a white sky. Yes. Could that be that we deserve pathetically to stare at a white sky? But anyway, guys, uh, we're going to give uh, Uncle Bill. Anyway, uh, I've got to wrap up today's Chronicle of the Collapse. Uh, I need to uh, get some factory raised pork chops on the grill. I have my buddy coming in. We gotta eat some pork chops and uh, enjoy this gorgeous sunset over the collapse forming. I highly advise you to get out there and enjoy uh, your own pork chop barbecue while you still can. Bye guys.